I'm Tom Curlin. Um, nice to be here. <clears throat> when uh, John invited me to do this, uh, I told him that I hadn't done any work on molten salt technology for over 50 years. <clears throat> he said, that's okay. <laughs> so um, if any of you are here just to hear about the latest technical advances, uh, now would be a good time for a nap. <laughs> um, I had the good fortune to go to work at Oak Ridge in 1961, and that was an interesting time in the history of reactor development. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission back then was throwing money at all kinds of reactors, uh, some of which made sense and some of which didn't. But um, Oak Ridge's share in that was Alvin Weinberg's uh, inspiration to work on fluid fuel reactors. Uh, the aqueous homogeneous reactor didn't work out too well, but work was going full steam on the molten salt reactor when I arrived. Uh, there was work on uh, the MSRE, of course, which was being built then, uh, and there was some work on <coughs> conceptual design of advanced reactors, which was um, where I got stuck. Um, worked at a small group headed by Lloyd Alexander. <clears throat> now, Lloyd was a pretty smart guy, and he realized that uh, fluid fuel reactors achieved a, an equilibrium state after running for a while, and after that, the composition of the reactor stayed pretty much constant. So he developed a way to um, uh, define the isotopic composition of the reactor after it reached equilibrium. And he developed a little computer code called equi Equilibrium Reactor Calculation. Uh, that was then coupled with a diffusion theory code to do the neutronics, and that ended up with a code called MERC, M-E-R-C. And we could input design parameters and it would come back with breeding ratio and fuel cycle costs. And that's what I was working with when I first came to Oak Ridge. But in those days, the way we communicated with a computer was punch cards. So we um, guessed at the design that was near optimum, uh, generated the data, punched out the cards, submitted the uh, card deck to the the computer system and wait until the next day to see what happened. <clears throat> then we'd do it again and again and again and again. So doing this optimization of the reactor design was a very laborious and time-consuming activity. Um, but we'd heard about automatic optimization techniques that could be implemented on a computer. So what we did, and it took about a week to do it, strangely enough, was to couple the analysis code with a gradient optimization program so that we could feed the cards to the computer once. It would grind out and find the optimum conditions and come back with the design parameters that gave the best performance, either the best breeding ratio or the lowest fuel cycle costs. That was a big step forward. It was really um, kind of tied in with the computers of the time. So the analysis procedure was redone when new computers were available. And a new program called ROD was developed. Stands for Reactor Optimization Design, I guess it was. <clears throat> so we worked on breeder reactors. And also we worked on thorium converter reactors. Uh, I'm Really not sure what the reason for focusing on the converter reactors was, but I suspect it was because we were aware of the difficulties of dealing with productinium. Um, so <clears throat> I played around with that stuff for a few years, and then I got lucky again and got assigned to work with Sid on the dynamics of the molten salt reactor. I don't really remember how that came about. Um, I was in the reactor division and Sid was in the INC division, but we partnered and it, it was one of the best things that ever happened in my career. Sid, oh, okay. 
Uh, so we decided to start off with an analysis of dynamic analysis of the molten salt reactor, molten salt reactor experiment. And it's interesting to see what the conditions were for doing dynamic analysis back then. Until just recently, really the only way to deal with a system like that was with an analog computer. But things had changed with digital computers and we were able to implement new methods to do the analysis. Now, the analysis of a system like the MSRE ended up with a large set of coupled differential equations. Uh, our reference design involved 44 coupled differential equations. Now, <clears throat> methods of matrix calculus had been developed long before, but um, there was no practical way to implement them because they were uh, so difficult computationally. But the new computers provided us with the capability to deal with the large sets of coupled differential equations as needed to analyze the reactor. Um, but we still had to worry about teaching the computer how to do it. So we were interested in both um, doing analysis, transient analysis, and also frequency response analysis. So Sid and his colleague um, Ray Adams developed a code called Matex in which you could input the coefficients for a large set of differential equations and it would crank out the time response. Uh, the frequency response is an alternate way to look at the dynamics of a system and we wanted to tackle that too. So a friend named Jim Lucius and I developed a code to take that same set of input data and crank out the frequency response for a system. So we did the analysis and everything looked good as far as the behavior of the MSRE dip looked when we uh, did the analysis. The next thing was to think about how we were gonna verify that analysis. So the MSRE was approaching operation. And so we got busy on planning some experiments that would help us to confirm the dynamic models did both transient responses and frequency responses. As I'm sure you know, the frequency response is the response of a system to sinusoidal inputs. But the only way we could introduce perturbations at the MSRE was with the control rods and, and they were not suited for introducing a sinusoidal input. But you know that any periodic signal can be represented by a Fourier series, a Fourier series of trigonometric functions. For example, a square wave uh, has a number of harmonics. The first harmonic is dominant, and then the other ones get smaller and smaller, but they're there. So <clears throat> that would have been a suitable way if our interest was to only get to get information at one frequency. But the frequencies of interest covered several decades. So we were looking for a signal that we could input into the reactor that was feasible with the available hardware, but also gave us information at a number of frequencies. And it turns out some work was underway and had a, a type of input signal called a pseudo-random binary sequence had that characteristic. So we decided on that as the input function we were gonna to use to test the reactor. So um, we use the online computer system at the, re at the MSRE to it'll input pseudo-random binary sequence step changes into the reactor and recorded those with the computer, took them home and analyzed them. Now the analysis required Fourier analysis and now anybody can do it with the fast Fourier transform that's available everywhere, but it was not available back then. So we had to develop our own software to do the Fourier analysis of the signals and came up with the frequency response that we alluded to earlier this morning. And fortunately, the results that we got were a quite good match with what the theory had said. So we felt like we had demonstrated that the analysis methods that we use to calculate the behavior of the reactor was appropriate and correct. 
Um, so from there on, <coughs> um, I guess we should mention the legacy that I think exists because of the work we did. The first thing I think we demonstrated that we really knew how to model a reactor and get appropriate and correct responses. And the second thing is that we demonstrated a feasible technique to do dynamic testing in an operating reactor. Um, I, along with a bunch of students, took the techniques that we used in the little eight megawatt molten salt reactor and went on to apply it in operating power reactors producing over 3,000 megawatts. And the procedures that we developed for the MSRE work just as well for those big reactors. So um, I guess that's the end of my story. Uh, as far as Gump would say, uh, that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> So when you had a uh, computer generating uh, the pseudo random the pseudo random numbers, was that being fed directly into the reactor, or was it giving you numbers that you guys punched in manually into the reactor? We programmed it into the online computer, oh, and the computer generated the signal that went to the control rod. So the computer was literally controlling the reactor yeah, and yeah. sending it the yeah. ups and downs. Okay. I should mention we had two glitches during the tests. One was, you know, we pull the rods up and down, up and down. Well, it stuck in the up position. And that was the night we set the new power record for the MSRE. <laughs> the other thing was that we told the rods to move, but they didn't do it right away because of it was a gear drive and you had to wait for the gear to mesh. So we got some strange results when we spread the strip charts out on the floor and crawled around looking at the responses and saw that it looked like the, there was a delay. Uh, Sid figured out what it was, and so we corrected for that. Did you guys yank the rods out? Didn't, Sorry? You, didn't you guys yank the rods out really quick one time by accident? No, that's what I was telling about. Oh, okay. It stuck in the up position. Oh, okay. It must have been exciting. I wanted to comment about that uh, incident where we pulled the rod up and it stuck and the power went way up. Uh, we didn't have to file an incident report. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Sir.